Well, I know in a room this size, we probably have many different people with many different experiences, both good or bad or rich or empty, uh, when we come to things of faith and religious practices. And uh, there might be lots of familiarity, but also might be a whole lot of unfamiliarness with this idea of Lent. Now, has I want to... Who here... I don't want to put anyone, oh, I'm going to put you on the spot anyway. Who here has, has a firm, would say, I have a firm understanding of what the season of Lent is for? How many people would here say, I am really confused about the season of Lent? You can, only, okay, so we have about the same. Everyone else is maybe somewhere in between. Maybe, there we go, we have a few more hands going up there. Somewhere in between. Uh, I want to be able to, uh, for this next six weeks leading into Easter, we as a church are going to be looking at the season of Lent, being able to talk about what it's, what it's for, maybe, maybe deconstruct some of the things that we've maybe used it for in the past, and be able to prepare ourselves for Easter that kind of helps set the stage for what Christ has done on the cross and for us to be able to journey alongside that story and find some richness in this tradition. And uh, I've talked a little bit in different emails that I've sent out, if you subscribe to the, the Loop email that I send out, and I've mentioned it a few times uh, in sermons as well, that uh, as an adult now, I am beginning to understand or unpack or relearn some of the things that, uh, that my tradition growing up had, uh, had taught me. And some of the things in my tradition growing up, I grew up in a, in a denomination that was not Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, it was a small little Baptist church in, uh, in uh, southern Ontario. I say small, it was probably about 130 people, roughly. Uh, and this Baptist church was filled with people who, who loved Jesus. They, they really did. Fantastic people in there. But the tradition that I grew up in was very, very skeptical about anything that resembled any kind of thing like the Catholic Church. Anything that was liturgical or hinted at being Catholic was very, very skeptical, and it was approached with much hesitation. And so as a 16-year-old, uh, being part of this, this congregation, there were things that I picked up on and, and, uh, and teaching that I internalized that, that kind of stuck very deep within me. And I want to be very fair that at 16, my sense of self-awareness and uh, my sense of awareness of what was happening on a larger scale probably wasn't very well developed, all right? So I want to be very charitable to the, the leaders of this church because it was really in a, in, a, in a very spiritually formative time in my life. Many fantastic things happened. I was baptized in that church. My best friend who I grew up with attended that church, and we both... I ended up going into the pastorate. Uh, there are many people who spoke into our lives, and they did fantastic things. The church still exists. It's great. Um, but the tradition had some baggage along it. And same with our tradition, and the Christian Missionary Alliance also has some baggage in it. And I'm sure that if you've grown up in here, you'll probably have to realize that you're dealing with some of my baggage as a communicator and a teacher that I'm hoping that you don't have to un unpack too much uh, of, of that. But we just realize that we're flawed in this way. So I want to be very charitable. But my approach to understanding Lent and understanding spiritual disciplines was very stunted. Uh, the tradition that I was in had a high value on salvation, which is fantastic. Getting people saved was of utmost importance. But the shadow side of it was is that it seemed that once people were saved, you could move on to the next person and get them saved. It was like the ultimate goal of what it meant to be a believer was being saved so that you could get to heaven. And so the spiritual disciplines, again, if they looked too liturgical, were kind of shunned because we don't need that was kind of the underlying statement about this. And I'm sure they didn't do this. I'm sure, like again, I was 16 uh, underdeveloped sense of self-awareness, but that was kind of the thing. And prayer was important, but prayer was probably one of the only spiritual disciplines that was embraced. We maybe talked about other things, like solitude or meditation, but even meditation was kind of like, careful, that might be new agey. And uh, so it was viewed as this way that what Jesus came to do was get people saved. 
As an adult, I've encountered the, uh, the, the teachings of Dallas Willard, uh, who's a fantastic, amazingly intelligent uh, philosopher, Christian philosopher, uh, who also uh, began to dabble in writing uh, for the, the church as well. And, uh, and he talks about it this way. Actually, go to the next slide. So one of the ideas of looking at Lent is that it was something to be suspicious of. This has been my, my experience growing up. And again, I feel like, like this is like a group therapy session, and you're just kind of coming along with me as I deal with my own garbage. Uh, so I hope as I deal with my own garbage, uh, it's a, some benefit to you in here. But Lent was something to be suspicious of, and Dallas Willard writes this, and this would have been characterized by my tradition growing up. He says this, he says, we must go beyond only trusting Jesus as a guilt remover. Gospels of sin management presume a Christ with no serious work other than redeeming humankind, and they foster vampire Christians who want only a little blood for their sins, but nothing more to do with Jesus until heaven. This kind of encapsulates some of the, my experience. Jesus came to die for you so that your sins could be forgiven, and then you just gotta hang on until you get called home to heaven. But what that is, there's truth in there, but there's also, it's not full enough. There is a part that what Jesus came to do was to draw you closer into him and to have an, a relationship with him, an intimacy with the living God that goes beyond just where you go when you die. And if we look at this as only Jesus coming only to get you into heaven, we're kind of missing so much more of what this rich faith could have. So when we look at Lent, we kind of have a suspicious view of Lent, but there's also another view of Lent. This one might be more predominant, and it's this, is that Lent is, uh, Lent is for self-improvement. It's the thing that you do, you give up some stuff for 40 days so that you can improve your life. Right? And so people will say, hey, what are you giving up for Lent? And I'm going to give up chocolate because I eat too much of it. Or I'm going to give up TV or I'm going to give up, uh, I don't know, whatever it is. And so we view Lent as self-improvement. And it's seen through uh, headlines like this in, in secular papers. So it has, non-Catholics use Lent as a chance for a resolution reboot. Have you fallen off your New Year's resolutions? Don't worry, here's Lent, a chance to kind of get back on it. And if you're not Catholic, really we can just kind of piggyback on this religious thing and uh, you can improve your life. Or there's another one that says, uh, maybe you want to save some money. Hey, strap for cash? You could save up, this is from the UK, you can save a thousand pounds by quitting these habits for Lent. It has no spiritual fulfillment, it's just a way of, hey, give up smoking, give up uh, booze, and uh, stop going out to eat, and you can save so much money for Lent. Or there's the other one that says, hey, you know what, uh, six nutri nutritionist approved habits to give up for Lent. So that you can kind of, here's, here's some good things you can give up, because you want to improve yourself. But the thing is, with all these headlines, is that it's this twisting of this beautiful tradition to support the very thing that this tradition was kind of established to combat, that is, a focus on ourselves. See, the period of Lent was not to focus on yourself and how to improve yourself, but when we take it as a way of self-improvement, we've actually just taken the richness of it, and we've twisted it all around and still made it all about us, which is, as humans, things that this is what we do all the time. It's always about us. It's always about me. My world revolves around me. And so if I do these practices to improve myself, again, it's all about me. Let's go to the next one here. So one of the things that we have with Lent is that when we are emptied of our comforts, we begin to be filled with what truly satisfies so giving up things for Lent is not just about trying to do self-improvement. It's not just about shedding a few pounds, saving a little bit of money, being more productive at work. The practice of Lent is of giving up is to take our eyes off of ourselves, emptying things that we find comfortable so that we can then be filled with God for what truly satisfies. Lenten practices are to take our eyes off of ourselves and put it on God to help, to be able to receive from him really the only comfort that really lasts, which is him. 
And Lent, as, as a time, it kind of came around about 325 A.D., when the church was kind of getting together, Council of Nicaea, and it was this idea that for 40 days, the church would fast, and we'd give up certain things. Mainly, it was food, traditionally, that you would give up, uh, give up meat and fatty, rich foods, so that when you f- have your hunger pang, it's supposed to remind you about your, your need and dependence on Jesus, and force you into a time where you can then focus on him and pray and commit with him. And this series of Lent, it's 40 days, we did, it was scriptural, they looked at it and went, well, Jesus went into the desert and 40 days he fasted, so we could probably follow after what Jesus did and also give up some of our comfort to be filled with what God can offer. Now, interestingly, uh, depending on what tradition that you're in, if you are Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians, when they do Lent, they do 40 days straight through. The Western church, which would be like Roman Catholicism, Anglicans, Protestants, that kind of stuff, we would, uh, Lent starts and it goes 40 days, but they break the fast on Sundays because Sunday is the resurrection day. And so we don't have to fast when we celebrate. So it's really, it's six days of fasting followed by a resurrection day where you can break that fast and keep doing that. That was very helpful the very first time I tried uh, fasting. I was in, in, in uh, at Briarcrest, and I figured I was kind of learning some things about fasting and about spiritual disciplines, and I'm, I said, I was going to give up coffee for Lent. If you know me, I'm very much into coffee, and I wanted to give it up, and this was a great idea, theoretically. It was also my fourth year of school. We had two young children with a third on the way, and it was in the middle of, like, exam time which is a terrible time to be giving up something that you depend on if, well, maybe it was a fantastic time for it, but I I made sure I wanted to have a day where I could break my fast, so Sundays were highly caffeinated days for me, uh, because I needed, if I could consume enough caffeine, maybe it could get me through the week. Uh, But this is kind of the, the origin of Lent, is being able to give up comforts so that our discomfort drives us further into Jesus. That's kind of the heritage there. And so when you look at different ways of approaching, uh, approaching spiritual disciplines in Lent, we have a skeptical view, we have a self-improvement view, and then we also have a spiritual discipline view. Let's go to the next one here. Lent as discipleship. Because that's really what it is. It, it's discipleship. You are learning to become like Jesus by looking at him and following in the things that he did, we can train ourselves and train our bodies to be able to give up the things that we just naturally selfishly want so that we can rely on him more fully. This is really discipleship. I love how Dallas Willard puts it. He talks about discipleship, but he says a better word for discipleship is apprenticeship, that we are Jesus' apprentices, and we apprentice to become like the master. This is uh, Richard Foster, and uh, he wrote a book, The Celebration of Discipline. And so he talks about Lent or spiritual disciplines in their place. He says, the disciplines are for the purpose of realizing a greater good. In and of themselves, disciplines have no value whatsoever. Next one here. Uh, they, uh, They have value only as a means of setting us before God so that he can give us the liberation that we seek. The liberation is the end. The disciplines are merely the means. We must clearly understand this limitation of the disciplines if we are to avoid bondage. Disciplines, the act of fasting, the act of, we're going to talk about a few of the disciplines that come up, they actually mean nothing. They have no value. Disciplines without Jesus as the focus will leave you in bondage. It will leave you in empty religion. And we want to be in a spot as a church where we are beginning to discipline ourselves to become disciples of Jesus or apprentices of the master so that we can adopt these spiritual disciplines so we can become more like him. 
Because the more like Jesus we become, the more filled, the more we empty ourselves out of the things that are not from him, it allows us to be filled with the things that are from him. And from that filled position, we are able to care, we're able to love, we're able to serve, able to give, able to uh, fight for justice in ways that we just can't if we are filled with the things that distract us in our selfishness. So perhaps fasting isn't the only discipline to begin to observe this Lent. And Richard Foster writes about these, he has three different areas of spiritual disciplines. And if you are a note taker, if you want to refer to them, I don't have them in the, you'll have to actually write them down here. So here's what he has. He says, there are, there are ones that are inward disciplines. And often I think, I might be wrong here, but uh, when we think of disciplines or spiritual disciplines, these are the ones that we often go to. They're ones that it's just you and God, which is super important. There's meditation, which would be taking some scripture and being able to meditate on it and read it and allow this living word to be able to speak to us. Uh, There's prayer, which we just did as a church. We did, did 72 hours of prayer. That's a spiritual discipline. Many of you gave up very valuable sleep time to be here at two in the morning, three in the morning, so that you can come and pray. That's a discipline. Great job. There's fasting, which is giving up of uh, eating of something, whether it's fasting from food or richness or rich food or sweets or whatever it might be. You can give something up so that when you go in a way, uh, it, when you want to head back to it and have it, it reminds you, yes, Jesus, I need to focus on him. Or maybe there's study where you can learn and dive deeper into it. All these are really important. And this, one, of, one of these on the list might be the thing that you want to dive into. Uh, So there's these inward disciplines. He also talks about these outward disciplines. That spiritual discipline actually involves other people. Uh, And, and, well, sorry, this is how you live. There's another next one coming up. So uh, outward disciplines, sorry, go back. I confused you, I'm sorry. Outward disciplines. These are ways of how you live your life. And simplicity is a discipline. We live in a culture where uh, acquiring things and filling your life with things, and filling your schedule with things becomes a badge of honor that only the really important people are, have stuff and have a full schedule. And if you don't have stuff and if you don't have a full schedule, what it really says is that you're not important. However, it's a spiritual discipline to lead a life of simplicity where you have margin, where you can, you can say no to an event. You can say no to living a simple life, and it's because you are disciplining yourself in this way. Solitude, for some of you introverts, you might actually need to be moving out of solitude and into, uh, into relationships with people, but for uh, some of you extroverts, solitude and getting away and being by yourself is a, a spiritual discipline. I don't do well with that one. I'm extroverted enough that by the end of day like two, I'm just itching to be around people. I try doing three days... Um, this past fall, and by the end of day two, I was on the phone to my wife and saying, Joe, you need to come pick me up. <laughs> I'm just, I just need some other people around me. I, I'm kind of done. Uh, I need to stretch myself in that. Submission, uh, that's a hard one because that, that word has lots of baggage attached to it of what it means to submit, but being able to submit to people and submit to leaders and submit your will to others, uh, that is, has a spiritual discipline, and if it's done in a healthy way, then that's not, it's not manipulative or damaging. Uh, and service, how you, how you go and serve. And then he says there's these other four that come up. Uh, he says these ones are, go to the next slide, corporate disciplines, which are things that we do together. As a body of believers, we have these disciplines that we can live in. Uh, confession. This is one that, again, our tradition as Protestants, we don't hold in high regard. But confession, where you actually go and you grab someone and you confess your sins to them, so that they can forgive you on behalf of God, this is an important thing. There is, there is real value in this. Gathering for worship is a spiritual discipline. Being here today, spiritual discipline. If you come tonight, you're stretching yourselves in a spiritual discipline. Uh, guidance, I'd be seeking after people to guide you along. And celebration. I don't celebrate well. Um, I tend to look at what the next thing is. And so as a church, when we finish this week, where we've prayed for 72 hours, we had the Shrove Tuesday meal, we had an Ash Wednesday thing, and that is worth celebrating, but my mind's going, what's next? 
And I need to slow down, and I need some of you who are good at celebrating to remind me we need to celebrate. God is doing things, and we need to be able to be attentive to what he is doing. So these are some of the things that we have with, uh, with these disciplines. Let's go to the next one here. Uh, Lent also empties us of our excuses. Uh, just like the law points out, uh, Lent is a way when we empty ourselves of the excuses that we have. I don't have time. I don't have enough money. Um, I'm just really busy. Whatever it might be, when we give up these things and empty our things, it gets rid of our excuses to be able to hear from God, which is exactly what the law does. And when we talk about the law, we're referring to the, all the laws that you see in the Old Testament, the things that the Israelites had to agree to and adhere to, the 613 of them, lots of laws. If you're in the Bible in a year plan, we're beginning to hit those laws. And uh, there's some dry reading in there as we realize what these laws are for. But the laws serve a purpose, and it's not just to adhere to them. We're going to be looking at uh, Romans chapter 3. Uh, starting at verse 9. This is the Apostle Paul. Uh, he is, used to be the chief Pharisee, like the Pharisee of all Pharisees. He knew the law. He was raised as a good Jewish boy. He was taught all the laws. He be, rose to prominence. He was very intelligent, very smart, a great leader. He then was leading the Pharisees to persecute the church because the church was, he felt, deviating from the laws and they needed to be uh, knocked down and dragged out. Uh, this person who had Im immersed himself in study of Scripture began to see things differently after his encounter with Christ. He began to view the laws differently as not as something to adhere to and you must do, but he realized that they served a different purpose. And so he says in Romans 3, verse 9, beginning, he says, so what should we conclude then? Do we, he's talking about the Jews, have any advantage? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. So he wants to go and say, like, hey, it's not that only like, the Jews are special and saved and these Gentiles are the ones that, that aren't saved. He says, no, we're all under this power of sin. And then he references a whole bunch of different psalms. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away and they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are empty graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He's just kind of paint, painting this picture going, we understand how sinful the world is. And with a good dose of self-awareness, we understand how sinful we are. That there are moments that we look and we say, I just, I am so inadequate to do the thing I need to do. I know what I should be doing, but my sinful nature just pulls me away from that. I stumbled again. I gave into temptation again. I lost my anger again. Uh, I gossiped again. I've just, I've become greedy again. I've become power hungry again. I've just, uh, this is just our lives. And it's in the midst of these difficult times that we're able to most see the sinfulness of the people around us and the world around us and also the sinfulness in our own hearts. Paul is pointing out, saying, this is what the law does. It shows us just how sinful you are. However, it doesn't leave you there. Verse 19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. See, the law is a standard that we simply cannot meet. I like how the, uh, the New Living Translation does this last verse. It says this. It says, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. 
The law is supposed to show us our weakness. It isn't supposed to be the thing that we can then do and then hold over and, and over everyone else. It's supposed to reveal that we're broken, and because we're broken, it's supposed to drive us not in shame away, but in response to God's grace. And we are either rebelling against God's laws and we are breaking them, or we're rebelling against his grace. And the older that I get, I just realize just how scandalous grace is. Because grace is there that when it shows you how sinful and broken you are, it then invites you in, but it's sometimes the shame that we carry that sin wants to point out. says you don't deserve being anywhere close to God, which is true. But his grace says, but I'm going to come and surround you. And so the law points out how sinful we are so that we can encounter God. In the same way, Lenten practices just reveal our misplaced hopes and desires. The things that we hold close, the comforts that we have, it just points out that those are misplaced. And when we give them up, it drives us further into God. And so we're at a spot where we get to be heading into this Lenten season, and it's not that you then take up a spiritual discipline because the discipline itself is good. Now, we, we already realize that without Jesus in the middle of it, those disciplines mean nothing. They have no value. But the discipline itself allows us to empty ourselves of our comfort. It reveals our brokenness and our need of a savior. And it drives us further into Jesus, where he stands with arms wide open, ready to welcome us. Because we don't have to put on a facade. We can try to put on a facade about how good we are. And in fact, in many religious cases, we are encouraged to put on facades. Don't let them see how broken you are. Don't let them see that anger. Don't let, that, don't let anyone see that anxiety you're carrying. Don't let anyone see that worry or the brokenness that you have. And because when you're here, you're supposed to look like you're put together. What this allows us to do is this allows us to take those masks off and say, I actually am really broken. I actually put my hope in things that can't satisfy. And if we can empty ourselves of those things, we become open for God to fill us of his goodness. I'm going to invite the, uh, the worship band back up. And, and we have a spot where, where we get to respond in this way where the table has been set. We're going to have communion together. The table has been set, and God knows exactly who we are. He knows what's behind those masks that we wear, and yet he sets a table for us and invites us to come and experience him. And so one of the things that we do with, on these communion Sundays is that we come forward for communion. And I like it because it's a challenge for us to take an outward action of things that have happened inwardly that we might not always want to come forward. But when we come forward, we take the steps going, I'm gonna lay down some of my pride. I'm gonna lay down some of my ego. I'm gonna come and realize I just need Jesus. I, I'm just exposed. My sinfulness and my brokenness is exposed, but we get to come and experience God who says, this is my body that's broken for you. This is my blood that's been poured out for you. And so I invite you as the band sings to be able to come forward and receive from the table that Jesus has prepared for you. If you're in the balcony, there'll be ushers up there to pass the plates. And if you're in the lobby in the foyer, there'll be people out there to, to serve you. If mobility is an issue, then we'll make sure that the servers will come and, uh, and serve you if mobility is, is difficult to come up to the front. But I invite you, let's stand and come to the table. There's beauty in the fact that we are absolutely broken. It's only when we are in a state where we are broken can we actually receive from God. And part of what the gospel is is just realizing that we're sinful and broken and need Him. But He came on our behalf and He said, I'm going to give myself up for you. So in, we have the cracker here and Jesus says, this is my body that's been broken for you. Eat remembrance of me. And then he says, I'm going to seal this promise. You don't have to do anything. It's been done 
with finality. I will shed my blood to seal this promise. There is nothing you can do to earn any salvation or favor. Jesus does it on our behalf. And he says, this is my blood. Pour it out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we conclude our time together here, I want to pray a blessing over you and then invite you back here tonight as well as we worship. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look on you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray this over you. Amen. If you'd like to come forward for prayer, we have a prayer team that would love to be able to pray with you for anything. Please come take advantage of that. We'll see you back here tonight, 6 o'clock.